I know, I love it. And it's like, yep, another day at the office. You know, this is, this is where we work. My name's Ted Cheeseman. I am from uh, Santa Cruz, California. My background is, while well, I grew up in Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris, my parents started the company when I was quite young. So from the age of 10, I uh, traveled internationally for summers. That was, you know, friends went to summer camp. I went to remote wildlife destinations in Australia and Africa. In the meantime, always saw myself as, I'm going to be a wildlife biologist. I'm going to be a scientist. Um, pursued that track, went through master's studies at Duke University. Tropical field biologist was my track. Um, but then when that study ended, it was like, okay, I decided to come work for the family business and in particular focus on our Antarctic expeditions. So now it's been 25 years of running expeditions to Antarctica and in the whole of it, you know, gradually I took over more management of the company. Um, so sometime in the early 2000s, I became kind of the central expedition leader for our Antarctica trips since 2015. Uh, I have been, no, 2016. I became the sole owner of Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris and then up until last year, now Gina and I co-own the company. But at the same time, I've taken a turn back to science. I'm doing a PhD on humpback whales, uh, which is just the coolest thing because over the course of my 25 years of expeditioning to Antarctica, we've seen whale populations go from virtually non-existent. Like we just saw very few whales when we first were going there till now, as they've recovered from uh, 20th century industrial whaling, you know, 100 years ago, they were just taken out uh, for over a period of about 60 years. Just every whale killed as much as possible. Now they're recovering um, and it's, it's a really wonderful thing to see. So the coolest thing to me about leading, organizing and leading that wildlife safaris around the world is that, you know, we're exposed to places that most people just don't have a chance to see and places that, uh, that, that are very expensive oftentimes for scientists to work in. So in that we've seen, you know, over these last decades, we've seen, right, we're seeing whales that the, just the records of them are quite meaningful to science. My interest in citizen science came from a recognition that what we were seeing was a value and yet wasn't getting too sciences and at the same time we didn't have the benefit of much of the information of sciences to convey the value of this to our travelers so to me it was like can we make a bridge where the photos that we're taking that are good data for science get to science get to the scientists the researchers to whom this would be of interest and at the same time could we use that link to get some information back from researchers to be able to really, you know, make it a more valuable, meaningful educational experience? And that's 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 really where this all launched off for me five years ago now, where building a citizen science web platform, Happy Whale, where the public contributes photos, we're able to identify the whales, the individual whales in those photos, and communicate that back to the public and at the same time then get this incredible trove of data from remote waters. I think it's in the range of about 50 countries now. I tend to end up in a new country about once a year, uh, but then my favorite thing is returning to the places that are so wild that it's never the same experience twice. For about a decade, I led all of our trips to the Galapagos. That was really wonderful. I love that context where you can really see evolution. As a kid, every other year for 15 years, I um, was on our East Africa safaris with my parents. I thought I was a leader. I was mostly probably just an annoying kid along the way. 
but I really put a lot of effort into learning the birds and about the wildlife, about the mammals that we were seeing. You know, 15 years of going every summer to, every other summer to Kenya and Tanzania mainly, but also Zimbabwe, Rwanda, Botswana, South Africa, Madagascar, Seychelles. Spent a fair bit of time in Australia, but really the Americas, Central, South America, and Antarctica have been my principal focus, um, in part because I speak Spanish and that works out very well. Um, but also, I, I really love the neotropics, I really love the temperate regions, the Patagonia, the southern cone as it's called, and then of course when you get to Antarctica, that's to me, it's the, the end of the earth where a lot of life really starts. Yeah, I mean, my friends would go to summer camp and I at the end of the summer I'd come back and um, I wouldn't know a thing about the media references of the summer movies. And I'd start stories of, well, in Zimbabwe, but then people would look at me funny. And I, I was, I suppose, a fair bit of a loner, but yeah, I was a nerdy kid and I was fine. I'm okay with that. I'm not sure if this is a fond memory, but in Australia, um, there was a strangler fig tree that the inside of the fig tree, that, that a strangler fig is a, a tree that a bird drops a seed into the crown of another seed, another tree and it sends a root down and it basically grows much like a potted plant on top of the tree until it gets a root down to the ground. And then from that root, it'll actually grow roots around the host tree until it basically becomes and overgrows the host tree, strangles the host tree and takes over. So there was this incredible strangler fig in Eastern Australia that the, the host tree had rotted out inside so you could climb up the inside of it. You know, I was a little monkey of a kid. I loved to climb things. I'd race up there and sort of try to coax all of our guests to come up and I was taking pictures of people climbing in the tree. I accidentally bumped the button that detaches the lens from the camera body. So the camera body went ricocheting all the way down the tree, in my dad's camera. And, well, he liked to destroy cameras himself. So at the end of the day, you know, there was a bit of a shrug and a, oh my God. I got to take a lot of risks in, um, in unique spaces and ways and, uh, you know, relatively controlled environments, um, but, uh, you know, really learned my limits in, in these extremes. When, you, when you're there present and you don't stop this space and this moment from happening, when nature unfolds so beautifully. I mean, to me, it's that like, when I'm zodiacing, zodiac cruising with a bunch of passengers and, and a bunch of guests, and we have, we have whales that are, you know, a reasonable distance apart, you know, we follow guidelines, responsible whale watching, but the whales don't follow those guidelines. They will be curious if we operate responsibly. Oftentimes they will be curious and come to us. This last February, you know, I had my group in the boat and here's this whale and this whale literally comes up to us and snuggles with our Zodiac. And it's just sitting there for maybe five breaths. Its breath is so loud that it's just, I mean, it sounds like a gas vent and, you know, and everyone was speechless. And it's these moments of absolute beauty that you couldn't create. No media, no video, no, you have to be there. I think one of my favorite things is when one of our travelers is drawn to tears by the power of the beauty of nature. Seeing these things through the eyes of one of our travelers for whom this is the first and only in these lifetime peak moments, I uh, vicariously somewhat really, really appreciate, uh, you know, their experience of it. Doing the wildlife safari right is getting us, you know, it might be crazy winds outside, but we find that little corner where there's protected water that we can get out and have a serene, beautiful wildlife experience in a hostile environment that, uh, you know, we might as, uh, might as well otherwise have said, ah, oh, sorry, you know, conditions aren't so good today. We're just gonna stay aboard, maybe better tomorrow. But instead we find that by local knowledge, by, you know, persistence uh, and get out there. At this point, you know, my favorite animal behavior is that of, of whales that 
are curious about us and they'll cruise up alongside of our boats. They'll check us out. They, you know, they see us maybe a little bit as a, something like a bath toy or something like just, you know, something different in an environment that uh, increasingly they are comfortable with the presence of humans. And as such, you know, maybe want to show us to their calf or see how we respond when they spy hop and seeing whales that uh, that appear to, you know, when, when people get excited, they actually will seem to be more present and more engaged and that I don't know what level to which they can un they can perceive our enthusiasm but it it seems to me that there's awareness and uh and and watching that and engaging in that is just it's just priceless